and I'm I'm just so honored to have Brooke here. Um, Brooke is a dear friend, a colleague, and um, as I've said in my emails, somebody who I really feel is a true healer, and I'm going to get emotional um, just because <laughs> I so respect Brooke. Um, not only because, you know, she studied at one of the preeminent acupuncture and Chinese medicine schools in the United States, um, has been a practitioner for over 15 years, um, and is somebody who has survived potentially life-threatening illness um, and is here with us today, offering herself and everything that she's learned. But above and beyond all of that, Brooke is also a practitioner of this centuries old tradition. And Brooke is somebody I respect on an even deeper level because she has spent months meditating um, and sitting <laughs> with what is, which in so many ways is even more challenging than going to acupuncture school um, or practicing. Um, and so with us tonight, we have someone who is not only a really skilled um, practitioner um, of Chinese medicine and acupuncture, but also somebody who's steeped in the tradition on a really profound level. Um, so welcome, Brooke. We're so grateful to have you. Wow, what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, it makes my heart feel tender too, because you and I are so close and yet so far away. And every time I'm with Lisa, there's just um, so much to talk about. <laughs> and you really have an understanding of the tradition that is so dear to me. And that's not all that common in the United States and particularly in New England. So, so I appreciate the reverence you have for it. Thank you. Absolutely. And for me, yeah, my feeling couldn't be more mutual. Um, so I am just going to do something I don't do that often, which is kind of talk this whole time. And I want to, you know, there's so much I can say and I will say, but I also um, want you to interject whenever questions come up or if I'm going too fast or uh, something, you have a curiosity or a confusion, uh, please, by all means, jump in. Um, because I just got done with teaching, I, I tend to be in a little bit of a hurry because we had such little time and so much to cover and the students had so many questions um, that it was really fun to think, oh, today, actually, I have a lot of time. So I'm gonna try not to rush, um, but let me know how it's going. So first of all, um, one of the most important things that I always try to remember both with patients and with teaching and with learning is that context is everything. And the way that my Taoist teacher used to say it is always consider view. Um, and like a lot of things I'll say today, this seems simple, but it's actually pretty profound that we wanna consider what is the view we're holding as we're taking in information. And so um, I'll start by just giving you a little bit of an outline about what I'll talk about today, but also what is the foundation of this information? Where is it coming from? Because it's not coming from me. I'm certainly intuitive, but I'm not psychic. And this isn't something that I'm feeding you and you should just eat because I say so. Um, and so it's important that for me to give you just a little taste of the foundation and history of where this all comes from. And then um, why listen to me? Why, like, why does it matter what I say? And again, I'll just talk a little bit about my own experience in education briefly, um, just so you have a sense of the view that's coming at you, where exactly it's coming from. And hopefully that can help you relate to it uh, from, from your own view. And so, um, I'll essentially today talk about the, the history of the tradition and some terms like chi and yin and yang so that you know what exactly I'm talking about. Um, and then we'll talk about this time of year, how that fits into this bigger sense of how the world works or in the Taoist 
view the way of things? And then how do we relate to that? How do we integrate um, what this time of year is about and um, what that means for us? And how do we how do we live that in our everyday complex modern lives? Um, and so, so to start in terms of me, I mean, Lisa did a great job of introducing me, but I grew up in the Midwest and then I thought that I would be an anthropologist. And um, then I had some health problems and started to think, well, it might be kind of nice to help the humans and then the humans can help the non-human primates and the rest of the humans. Um, <laughs> But I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I got really curious when I took a, um, um, a physics class. I was taking a bunch of sort of pre-med prerequisite classes, thinking that I probably wouldn't go to med school, but I, I would do something having to do with health and healing. And I just fell in love with physics. And then I had this anthropology background and I moved to San Francisco after traveling in Southeast Asia and met people who were getting acupuncture and start and and you know there's such a such a prominent um, Asian and Chinese population in the Bay Area um, it's just so normal to get acupuncture and cook herbs and be sort of thinking from this perspective that it sort of started to come together I mean of course I see this more in hindsight I didn't see it at the time um, but that wow the Chinese have been looking at energy uh, longer than anyone. And they have a real understanding of how that's the foundation of our existence and the relevance of that to health and healing. And that that tradition um, has survived thousands and thousands of years. So that's not a fad. Um, and that's something I've really come to appreciate more than ever. Um, but at the time, I just was curious and sort of following the breadcrumbs. And I think, you know, it, there, in some sense, I was welcomed into a lineage and am very, very lucky to practice that. So it's a master of science and it's a four year graduate rigorous program. Um, and then I was lucky enough to meet my Taoist teacher from whom I learned for many years, um, the cosmology aspect of things and the food as medicine aspect of things, which traditionally would have never been separate from the medicine. But in school, you have to memorize points and herbs, you have to memorize Western red flags, you have to get ready for the board exams. There's only so much you can cover in four years. Um, and so, so that part I've been able to integrate and it's, um, it's really broadened and deepened the medicine in, in a profound way for me um, because I realized the medicine isn't just about someone comes to me and you know some sort of heroic Judeo-Christian, like, and then I save them. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the Taoist view is here we all here, here we all are in this sort of messy stream and we're going along together. And um, for some reason, I apparently am given this understanding of this um, so that I can meet people where they are and we can learn from each other and hopefully some harmony and, and health and healing can come from that exchange. Um, and I think that's my most favorite thing about doing this work is that there's, there's something kind of magical that occurs most of the time when I have an acupuncture patient or I do a cosmology consultation um, and it changes me as much as it changes the other person. And so in a way, um, it's like my dirty little secret <laughs> that I'm getting as much from this as everyone else is. So <laughs> that's quite lucky. So that's that's the context essentially of um, where I'm coming from, and I and I lived and um, was educated and practiced in San Francisco for most of my adult life, and then about ten years ago I moved to Vermont and um, have been practicing here ever since. And the intensity of the weather here and um, the availability of big yin, which I'll talk more about. Um, has been an incredibly direct teacher of what I'm about to talk about, about what the five elements are and um, the direct experience of, of being a human in reciprocity with our environment, with community and with the, the community of nature um, in, a, in a really different way than was available in California. So again, I feel, feel lucky for this trajectory. And from what I understand, you all are um, all in different places, right? In the United States. 
some in Vermont and some not in Vermont. Is that right? Okay. That's true, Brooke. Yeah. Okay. And, um, a lot of folks joining tonight are Vermont based um, and Pennsylvania based, but we do have folks in New York, LA, Florida, the Midwest. Um, nice. So yeah. Scattered. Right okay. Yeah. Different, different experiences of the movement of chi, as we say. Okay, great. Um, so so let's just start with a little bit about the foundations, um, both of Chinese cosmology and Chinese medicine. Um, essentially, this tradition started longer ago than we really know. Um, it certainly started to be written down about three to 5,000 years ago, but we have evidence of people starting to think um, in the Taoist worldview, which led to the cosmology and medicine about eight to 10,000 years ago. And at the heart, what it was, was people sitting around in what is today China and Mongolia, not having a lot of distractions and looking around and going, oh, there are some reliable patterns here that, um, that never change. And the most reliable one is yin transforms into yang back to yin and back to yang again, always one into the other. And the easiest way to understand this is day turns to night, back to day, to night, that never changes. And again, that sounds simple, but um, it's profound because it is the thing that is um, moving our very existence. And that's on a macro and that's on a micro level. So on the bigger, scale, it's what's making the planets move is this, this transformation from um, appearance to disappearance or chaos to order or appearing, um, appearing, not appearing, movement and not movement. So what's pushing the planets is the same thing that's also helping our cells um, transform and transport. And that's how the medicine was eventually evolved was that people started to see, oh, this, all of this, these patterns and this movement I can see in nature is reflected in the body. And so there's a lot of wisdom there about those systems and patterns and how they're mirrored. Um, and, and this yin and yang transformation thing, um, we began to call it chi. Oh, so this is stuff moving through time. That's what chi is. Now that's like an entire lecture in and of itself, but the thing to know is that you, you hear things about chi that are often inaccurate, like it's this invis in invisible stuff moving through invisible tubes in the body and we acupuncturists put in needles in and move it around. No, <laughs> that's not what's happening. And, and the reason there's a misunderstanding is because we are talking about different worldviews. So that is from a worldview that is um, reductionist and linear and um, more about structure. And we are more about function and movement and the nonlinear, the, the Chinese tradition is descriptive. And so we're describing phenomena. When we say qi, we're saying stuff is moving. So if someone were to say, were well, you talking about circulation? Why, yes, I am. Are you talking about respiration? Uh-huh, that too. <laughs> same, same. It reminds me of in Thailand when there's the saying, same, same, but different. <laughs> it's kind of this non-Western idea that um, of yes and, description of phenomena. And so, so out of this came something called five element theory, um, or sometimes it's called the stems and the branches. And the five stems are the five elements, which you may have heard of, wood into fire, into um, earth, into metal, into water, back to wood. This is a generative cycle and it's describing uh, more specifically how yin and yang transform and the movement of chi. And now we could be talking about a day, we could be talking about a life cycle, we could be talking about the seasons. Um, again, we're talking about the movement of chi, um, basically how things are, the Tao, from a Taoist perspective, just 
what is um, almost impossible to point to because it's like that thing of like fish saying what's water, you know what is is it's it it, it she is everywhere it's everything so a little hard to talk about um, but a really easy way to understand the five elements is to think about seasonality. So wood is a way of describing what we feel in the springtime, which is this just sort of shooting up of energy, the creative spark, birth. And then fire is always following wood. Again, this is a non-negotiable. This is like day always coming after night. Summer will always come after spring. Now, whether we have different seasons or not, whether the weather changes or not is sometimes relevant, sometimes not, but the point is the chi movement. So after wood, birth, newness, creativity, comes fire, which is the movement toward manifestation. It's movement itself, it's adolescence or the height of summer. And then after that comes earth, which is late summer, or um, you know when the zucchinis are big in, um, in Vermont, the, the garden is full, or the middle of our life is another way to think about it. So we've come to full manifestation. We are now a thing. Um, we are, we have our house set up in our family and that kind of thing, if we want to think of it as like a traditional human sense. And then after earth comes metal, which is the fall, which is now we're moving away from manifestation. And so the leaves are falling off the trees and things are starting to die. Or in a human life, we are focusing less on the outer and more on the inner and sort of reflecting and deciding what matters and what we want to take with us. And then the last part of this cycle is water, which is where we find ourselves now. And it's the winter or the end of life. Um, it's like the big soup that it all comes from before it goes back to wood, the birth of an idea or a life or a thing again. So is that making sense? Okay, great, 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 good. Um, and so, so again, why, why do we care? What, what is it about these theories that we are concerned with or that we relate to? Um, because none of us gets out of this cycle. <laughs> you know, this is living every day, every life. Um, if you are alive on the planet, you will live the five elements. And the beauty of it is if you start thinking of this, of it in this way, you start to see it everywhere. You know, when I started to learn about this, I remember asking my teacher, oh, is California a fire? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I think it's a wood and a fire. And then I came to Vermont and was like, oh, it's all metal and water here. Um, and you start to see that, you know, in one sense, um, you know, of course, not, none of this is fixed. You, it, we are always moving from one thing to the other. So if I am say in the earth point, part of my life, I'm already moving toward metal. Um, and so in a way we all encompass all of it and our experience encompasses all of it. But where it can be helpful is to see, okay, what is being presented in terms of the chi expression or the element and how am I wanting it to be different? Um, and we'll go a little bit more into this when it comes to living in a fire culture, um, just one quick example is just that, um, you know, the going and the doing is where all of the value is placed in our culture. And so it's all fire, fire, fire. Um, and my teacher used to say, it's not that yin is more important. It's just that we don't emphasize it enough. So we teachers have to really emphasize the yin part of things. So I'm constantly talking to my patients about the yin aspect of things and, and not that it matters more, just that we are sort of addicted to yang, to going and doing and progress. Um, and, you know, we could look at lots of reasons that is, I mean, probably the fundamental turning away from death and from darkness and wanting to pretend that the dark side of things doesn't exist. And, you know, understandably, that's hard. Um, and especially in a culture that doesn't have roots in that not being a problem. 
you know, being in a very heroic culture that um, in medicine and politics and in family systems in so many ways um, that says that the most important thing is youth and doing. Um, I think in a lot of other cultures, maybe there's less fire and there's more water available because there is an appreciation of elders and there's an appreciation of death. And there's those of us who have lived or people who have, I haven't so much, um, close to the land, just have, um, I think, an automatic understanding of death and birth just being different phases of life and our um, sort of singularity of my own life and my own body is not the important part of existing, but we are challenged that way in our culture. So we have to talk about yin a little more. Um, and so, so where do we find ourselves right now? Um, there's two things I'll talk about here, a little bit from the medicinal side of things and a little bit from the cosmology side of things. And um, more broadly, where we find ourselves right now is called the season of water. And as I mentioned, this is, you know, it is all of a, cir all a circle. So there isn't a start and, a, and an end. And yet, if we consider birth or wood or springtime, a certain kind of beginning, then right now we are at a certain kind of end, um, but in service to beginning again. So that's the part that I think is really beautiful to remember um, that it's all a circle. And, and the water season, as I mentioned, is called big yin. So what does that mean? Um, I think a great way to think about this is like, this is the energetic of grandmother. We're moving more slowly. There's more wisdom available. Um, everything is condensing. If you think about water at this time of year, like Lake Champlain, though it doesn't freeze over so much anymore because of global warming. Um, theoretically, if the temperatures were as cold as they are supposed to be, um, it would completely freeze, completely condense. So we're coming down and in. That's the nature of the chi movement this time of year. And sometimes a way to understand something is by its opposite. So if you think of summertime or fire um, as all movement and springing up and out and sort of, um, if this is the queen grandmother, that's the little prince, the little boy running around full of life. Um, and so this is the time that we're more thinking about um, germination. I also think so much about it being, we're gestating now, we're moving down into the womb of our experience or of the world and, um, you know, most cultures, at least at this northern of a latitude, would either migrate or hibernate this time of year. And um, again, I always like to put this in a modern context, you know, because when I was first learning these things, I thought, well, great, what am I supposed to do? Like, I still have to have a job. <laughs> um, but I will take fewer patients at five o'clock in the wintertime. I will take more time off. I will take a nap on my own treatment table. Um, you know, I'm always talking to people about finding little ways to sneak this in. Um, you know, maybe if I have a phone conversation with someone on a Saturday, I won't have three phone conversations. <laughs> Whereas in the summer, you know, you can meet someone for a picnic at 8 p.m. and you have all this energy to do that. This time of year, by six or seven, you're kind of done. Um, and it makes me think of, someone told me that some records of um, people in North America in the last couple hundred years showed um, people talking about having two sleeps where it would get dark and they would eat and then they would go to sleep around six or seven. Then they would get back up around midnight or one o'clock, stoke the fire, have another snack, maybe kind of talk or rub each other's feet and then go back to bed again. And I thought that was really profound because in the winter, sometimes you, you can sleep for 10 or 12 hours and you need that. Um, this is a potent countercultural concept because again, the, the idea of health and strength is that we can do anything we want all the time, our whole lives, all year round. 
Um, and that is just not the way anything in reality has ever worked. <laughs> and maybe you can do that when you're 20, but it's interesting even talking about this with my students, they, they felt it right away. They said, oh yeah, I, I don't wanna talk to people so much in the winter. <laughs> um, so I think it's refreshing to feel what we already feel and say, oh, right, that's just how it is. And I can let my animal body have what it wants to have when it wants to have it. Um, and so, so that's where we find ourselves now in the water season. And um, I came across this poem earlier today and I, I just wanna read it to you because I think sometimes poetry can really illustrate a concept better than anything else. And I think it, it has such a water quality to it. Um, it's by Joanna Klink from a book called The Night Fields. And she says, there is no almanac for the living. A pulse flies and then stops. You are pain pinned to muscle. Also grasses, breath, tree dawns and gears. You are dark arteries of quiet, the white heat smashed through deserts and levers and coasts, that flickering pause between thoughts, that flickering pause between thoughts. More even than your own life, you flow from what is. The stars swept into stillness, the ground drinking rain. You are the whole shape of sound, whether or not you sing. So my favorite line is that flickering pause between thoughts. You know, this is the time of year where we get to discover that what we are is so much more vast than what we do. And having a direct experience of that is profoundly relaxing. And then we find that relaxing isn't actually something we do. It's just what we are. It's naturally there. It's available all the time. But that's a direct experience, I think, that we have to have by slowing down and not doing so much. And that's hard. That's hard. You can know all this, and it's still hard. And it's a practice. And so, um, in terms of more specifically, so that's broadly what the water season is about. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about sort of some of the conduct you can think about more specifically and the food and um, what is available to help us stay harmonized during water season. Um, you know, again, I wanna keep circling back to like, why, why do we care? Why, why listen to this? You know, it's not because I say it's this way. Um, it's because we are interested in not pushing against because essentially that's the seed of suffering, right? Wanting things to be different than they are. So if we know more about how things are and how we are, then it's more available to us to go with that instead of against that. And again, that's a very constant practice. Um, a Buddhist concept that I like to think about so often because it really clears the clutter of everything else is um, this now, how do I wanna to relate to it? That's it, no future, no past. This now, how do I wanna to relate to it? Um, and so if we go into that moment and that question with a foundation of how things are and how we are, then there's a lot less clutter. And there's a lot more harmony available because you're sort of swimming with the stream instead of trying to make the stream different than it is. Kind of insane, but we're doing it all the time. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if, Lisa, did you listen to Michael Pollan's little book about coffee, about caffeine? It was yeah. so, did, did any of you hear that? Oh, it's so interesting. And so what was so interesting to me to, was to hear essentially that, you know, caffeine blocks adenosine, right? Which is the, the thing that tells you you're sleepy or you're tired or you need to rest. Um, and what a great thing, blocks it, you don't feel it. 
you can be busy, busy, busy. But um, another thing that he said that I think about so much is that doesn't mean um, it's not there. And it, it doesn't mean the adenosine is not there. And it doesn't mean the tiredness and the fatigue isn't there. Um, and so what a perfect example of, you know, fighting with what is. <laughs> And I'm guilty, I drink coffee sometimes, um, but I really can feel how it's pushing me in a way um, that isn't really natural to my constitution or to the season. I mean, I really feel it this time of year when I have it more than I feel it in the summertime. It's really fighting with what is. That's like a fundamental fighting with what is. And we'll, we'll block the thing that tells us we're tired instead of just saying, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> I think I'll just take a nap. Um, and I don't mean that in a righteous way at all. This is, you know, this is something we're all grappling with all the time. And we have to be very kind to ourselves as we, as we make our way through the modern gauntlet of possibilities. Um, but so that's the broad stroke of water. And before we come back to kind of conduct and food, uh, more about that, I want to talk a little bit about the cosmology because, um, I think it's so interesting so where we find ourselves in the calendar and um, just a little bit of history and context about what I mean by the calendar is that so, so these folks that were sitting around, let's go back to five to 8,000 years ago, looking around, seeing how things work. Um, not only did they develop a system of medicine and write it all down, but they also developed something called the Tongshu Almanac. Um, which is allegedly one of the most um, the the most published works in the in the history of the world. Now you can go online to tongshu.com and you can look up the auspices of the day. And it's said that um, much of the population in China is not literate. They are farmers, but you can pull any one of them aside and ask them. Uh, what today is about, and they'll be able to tell you exactly. And what I mean by this calendar and what it is keeping track of are cycles of time. And the five elements, the five, um, the five stems um, go in conjunction with um, the 12 branches, which are these animal images that you may have heard of, like this is the year of the ox. And what those are, are, are more getting more specific in describing chi. And so the animals are a way of describing the yin and the yang of each of the five elements. So for instance, we say this is an ox here, ox is the yin of earth. And the Tangshu Almanac has been keeping track of how these five elements and these 12 animals um, cycle for thousands of years. And why does it matter? Why do we care? Again, because you can look, ooh, sorry, my lamp just <laughs> decided to get brighter. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think that's better. Um, <laughs> and so why do we care? Because we can look at these cycles and say, okay, well, what happened 12 years ago when it was an ox year? What happened 60 years ago when it was a metal ox year? what happened 120 years ago when it was a metal ox year. And that can help me understand maybe what will be going on now and how to relate to it. Um, now I'm always careful to say this isn't about fortune telling or predicting because being a human being, we have this dance of fate and freedom, we call it. You know, there's some things that um, the opportunities and obstacles are, just what they are, but that's what's available. What we do with it, there's a lot that factors into that. Um, so we can't necessarily be predictive, but we can be wise. And so where do we find ourselves now in that calendar? Um, we are in a metal ox year and we just entered with the new moon, um, the metal rat month and and so being in a metal ox year, um, if you want to know more about that, I did give a whole talk on Vimeo about this um, last February or March, and you can download it. Um, I think it might be on my website now, um, but we're nearing the end of this year. But essentially, like I said, ox is the yin of earth. 
And so really, if you think of the image of an ox, what has been available is about just simply plodding forward, plowing the field um, and being retrospective. So much ox energy is about looking back and asking, okay, what have we done before? And how can that inform us about how we wanna move forward? And then the metal aspect gives some discernment. And um, a great archetype for this is Obama. He was born in the year of the metal ox. Um, he turned 60 this year. And he does have a way of just kind of doing what needs to be done. Um, also with a nod to the past and, and looking how things have been. Um, but being reliable about plotting forward. And so that's kind of been the general chi of this year. Um, but we came out of a metal rat year, which was last year. And, um, you know, so interesting to have gone through a pandemic during a rat year. Um, rat is the yang of water. And <laughs> what, that's, what that's talking about, the yang of water is about our fundamental interconnectedness. Um, these, are, these animal images are chosen for a reason because they are descriptive of the chi. And so what was available in um, the year of COVID was finding out how our connection to each other is inescapable for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, a great way to think about this is like a rat will look at a barn and say, okay, we can take this whole giant thing down, but we have to do it together. Um, and so rat is this idea that we are nothing if we aren't the whole. Um, and we really got a sober lesson in that last year. <laughs> and so I'm bringing this up now because we're entering right now a metal rat month. And so in a way, this is truly the last couple months of the metal ox year are, this is our last chance to use our retrospective capacity and say, okay, what did I learn? What stay, what needs to stay? What needs to go? Um, what kind of seeds do I wanna plant and what will be germinating while I go into this next year? Um, and from a Chinese cosmology point of view, next year will be very, the, the available chi will be very different. Um, ox and rat were somewhat similar as we found, we're still kind of trudging along through this pandemic thing. Um, next year is water tiger. And if you think it's like a full grown tiger. And so it's <laughs> running forward 180 miles an hour or it's collapsed in the grass, there's nothing in the middle. That's a very different energy than the plodding plodding of an ox. So I've been warning people, those of us who are a little impatient or bored um, with how nothing's really been moving forward this year, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> and so a great thing I have been thinking about for you know th this month and next month is like batten down the hatches. Um, and we would be doing this during water season anyway. You know, this is the time we think about, okay, the grain silos are empty. How do we store again? Because when spring comes and the energy is moving forward, nothing's growing yet. We're still empty. Um, and I'm coming at that from a cheap perspective. Um, I often tell people the first few months of the new year, but especially in a tiger year, um, just try to not make any big moves. <laughs> and in order to prepare for that, we can really sort of ground ourselves now, you know, sort of, um, oh, what do I wanna say? Finish up, sort of shore up uh, the things that we've wanted to go back and reflect on or, um, or store up to sort of prepare ourselves for a new year. Um, and so, so what's available during metal rat time, there's sort of, we say chi full and chi empty. The chi full expression is, hey, we're in this together. Let's make the most of that. The chi empty is that obsessive hoarding, you know, how rats are, they make a nest and then they make another nest. And then they make another nest and they forget that they made the last nest. And I thought so much about this at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was hoarding toilet paper. <laughs> it's like, this is the chi empty expression of rats. So 
again, here we are um, in a month where all of that will be available. Do we want to relate to our anxiety part of our interconnectedness or do we want to relate to the bar part that says, let's take this barn down together? I think that's a great question to ask ourselves in the next month. Um, And then, um, everyone doing okay? Okay. Um, so, so just to kind of finish this up, um, back to thinking in the broader sense about the water time of year and thinking, you know, how, so how do we relate to all of this information? I just gave you a, a lot of information. It's a lot to digest. Um, and so how is it relevant to our sort of everyday modern lives? What, what do I do with this exactly? Um, so that I can live in the stream instead of against the stream. And in terms of what we call, you know, I don't love this word conduct. It sounds so harsh. Um, from a Taoist point of view, it's very neutral. It's just like, okay, what can I do to live with things as they are? Uh, there's no morality involved. Uh, and, and some things that I thought about to, to give to you are, first of all, stoking these fires of connection. Um, you know, I've never had a wood stove, but from what I understand, if that's your source of heat, you have to sort of like keep that fire burning all the time so the pipes don't freeze. And I love this image, thinking about getting through winter. You know, we have all this big yin and all of this water. So we have condensing and we have reflecting and we have hibernating available, um, but we're not dead. We want to have fire, we want to have circulation. And so how do we stoke the fires of connection during this big yin time so that we don't drown? Um, and this I think is a wonderful reflection for each individual. You know, for some it might be, you know, like I've added a bunch of, um, of poetry follows on my Instagram account <laughs> because I need to read poetry every day. That's how I stay connected to what matters to me. Um, for some people, it might be that they want to keep being social, but not like you're going to go out and see music at nine o'clock at night, more like you're going to go bundle up and go for a walk with a friend. Um, or it might be like a reconnection with food. I know a lot of us end up busy and traveling and, um, running around during the summer. And then when it comes to winter, I certainly have a lot more time in my kitchen. Um, and so I can connect again with what are my favorite recipes and how do I wanna feed myself and others? Um, so stoking the fire of connection. And then this idea of storing and consolidating, um, this can be a lot of different things. Um, my teacher used to talk about this thing he called the yoga of no. So when people say, oh, can you help me with a no? Oh, do you want to meet? No. Oh, are you a no? And each time you say no, feeling your chi come back to you. <laughs> and I think especially as women, we are so conditioned to yes, yes, yes. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable to say no. It's hard. And, it, and even say, even even proposing that to you, frankly, is uncomfortable that, oh, you wouldn't help someone if they need your help. I mean, that's just, <laughs> um, but I talk so much with my patients about um, doing less, saying no, that is a way of pulling in your chi, consolidating and conserving. Um, and uh, again, it's a practice. Um, and then on that note, lots of permission and lots of forgiveness. Um, there is this other poem, I don't have it in front of me, but it's really short by Mary Oliver. And she says something like, um, okay, big darkness, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna forgive you for everything. <laughs> it's like that short, it's like two senses, um, but it makes me think what a beautiful time of year to think of this concept of, um, you know, I even think of it in this way when I look out at the garden you know, that isn't there anymore. It's all raked up and it's like, whatever happened, you know, the tomatoes that I didn't pin up well and the, <laughs> the lettuce that got eaten by the rabbits, but the shard that grew so beautifully, like, forget it, it's all, it's over, it's done. Um, and we don't have to take that with us into our hibernation. We can let it all go. 
And then we can just give ourselves permission to sort of work with all of this the best we can and see that the people around us really are in this messy stream too, just trying to figure out how to go with it and instead of against, and they don't know what they're doing any more than we do. And we can really forgive each other for that. This is a good, good time to do that. Um, and so in terms of food, this is, this is the time of year to be thinking about deep nourishment on all levels. Um, so the way we cook things and how and what is available. Um, and so, so the water time of year is related to what we call in Chinese medicine, the kidney. And we are talking about the kidney organ, but more so um, that's a bad translation or a close as close as we can get translation to a bigger concept in Chinese medicine that is about the endocrine system and it's about the bones and it's about our DNA and it's about what we call our prenatal chi, which is sort of like you have a certain amount of stuff you came in with and you'll only get so much of it. And so you have your postnatal chi, which is kind of like your cash account and you're spending that every day and you're eating and filling it back up and spending it. But your prenatal chi is like your savings account and you don't want to spend it. And most of us have been dipping in our whole lives. For instance, every time we don't say no when we need to say no, <laughs> you're like, oh, dipping into that kidney chi. Um, and we don't want to exhaust that because that's when we have illness and death. And so if we can nourish ourselves on that level, um, we can stay a little bit more hearty. And um, so, so the way that we nourish our kidneys um, fundamentally is about cooking our food. Um, cooking, I'm sure you all have talked about this by now, but cooking is pre-digesting. And so you're taking the pressure off of your body and your energy to work really hard to break down all the food when you cook it first, um, because the cooking is doing that for you. And so in the winter, low temperature, slow, long cooking times, that's gonna really extract all of that deeply nourishing yin energy, um, prenatal chi nourishment. And so roasting, crock pot, that kind of thing. Um, I just made some, some Chinese beef spare ribs and I cook them for 10 hours. And oh my gosh, I mean, you can just, when you taste them, it's like you can taste the depth of that nourishment to your body. Um, and then just the direct thing of like 15 minutes of prep, 10 hours of the crock pot doing the work for you, you get to hang out and take a nap while that's happening. That's like wonderfully nourishing for your body and for your life. Um, and then in that vein, soups and stews and bone broths, um, fat, fat is heavy and it sort of brings everything down and in, it grounds us. And it's also so nutrient dense that you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. So that's kind of the idea too with winter food is that we're slowing down and we're moving less so we can eat a little less, but we want to get more from what we're eating. So nourish, um, nutrient dense things like fat. Um, and then from a Chinese medicine point of view, we're supporting the kidney and we're supporting the lungs. Um, and so things that do that are roots and seeds, um, things that look black, things that look bloody, things that look how you would think of as like down and in or the womb deep in the ground. So sweet potatoes, black sesame, those are things that are real Chinese favorites through the winter. Um, and then things that are astringing. So they're pulling in your chi. So instead of like sweating and pushing the chi out like you would do in the summertime, you're pulling the chi in. Um, one of my favorite things for this is persimmon. And persimmon is really hard to find in New England, um, but I'm happy to say I found some the other day in City Market. They're a little rough. <laughs> but I'm gonna make them into a persimmon chutney um, from the Five Seasons TCM site. And if Lisa hasn't already pointed you to this, um, I highly recommend this woman, Zoe Gong. She is 
a Chinese medicine food expert and her recipes are amazing. So um, at Thanksgiving, I made, um, I made her pears. She does like a, not a poached, what it's, yeah, it's like a poached pear. Um, pears are great for the lungs. If you look at a pear, you see how they look like a lung, right? This is the beauty of the Chinese pharmacopoeia is that often we can look at a plant and know what it's doing for us. So, so pears are going to help with dryness. And if you're keeping your lungs and kidneys nourished and you're not dry, then you're less susceptible, your immunity is stronger. Um, and so, so a recipe like poached pears with cinnamon and ginger is going to keep your circulation going. It's stoking that fire. It's nourishing your lungs um, and you're cooking it for a while. So you're still eating fruit and you're getting those nutrients, but you're not having to work so hard to digest. Um, and then just in general, you know, this will be so straightforward to you because you have a body and you live through the winter, um, but warming spices, like I said, cinnamon and ginger and things that get our circulation going. Um, so helpful for the immune system. We know from Western studies that those things absolutely um, boost our immune system up and make us stronger. And from a Chinese medicine point of view, what they're doing is fortifying what we call our wei qi or our protective layer on the outside. Um, so we're less likely to get sick and we keep circulating during the time of consolidation. Um, okay, that's a lot of stuff. How are you doing with all of that? What questions do you have? This is your chance to ask Brooke a question. <laughs> I know it's a lot to digest, it's a lot to take in. Yeah. Brooke, I have a question, um, yeah. Yeah. which is, a curiosity, if you have an example of another time in history when we went from a metal ox to a water tiger. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, 60 years ago, we did it. Okay. Um, and I have not, I always look that up before I give my New Year's talk. Um, and I haven't looked it up yet. But if we could think about 60 years ago, I mean, it certainly was a time of upheaval <laughs> in the United States, at least. Now, this is an interesting thing because we're thinking about the world and then we're thinking about the United States. And the thing I'm thinking about is that the United States is a fire monkey. The United States was born during the year of the fire monkey and that's the exact diametric opposite of water tiger. Um, so not fundamentally a problem, but certainly the potential for volatility. Now that's the United States, right? That's not the whole world. So that's interesting too. Um, and then to that point, we all have our own constitution and, and back to the beginning a view that gives us a certain view that gives us a certain ability to digest or not digest that, that particular year's energy so well. So I can say, ooh, ooh, fire or water tiger, but that will mean something different for everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And when Brooke's talk comes out um, in February or March, I'll share the link with you all because it is 110% worth it to listen. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's yeah. really fun to do. It's really yeah. fun. Yeah. Cheryl, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask if you could... Um, talk a little bit more about Zoe Gong and her recipes or what the link is. Is she a local person? She's in New York. I think she's in, she's in Manhattan or Brooklyn. Um, okay. And you can get them, those links, right, Lisa? Yeah, yes. she's interesting. I, I, don't, I don't think she's an acupuncturist. I think she's just a very smart, young Chinese woman who has a lineage in her family of um, food medicine, right? Yeah. Yeah, she does practice acupuncture, um, oh. but not so much. She started a clinic and now oh. there are more folks who are doing the needling and she's kind of working on these other pieces. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. Because I was so, I was like, how does she know all this? And she didn't go to school, but I just figured it was from her family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, and I shared the link to the recipes in the chat and I'll share it in my email as well. Yeah, she's great. She is. Yeah. I, I also wanted to ask you if you could talk a minute, Brooke, about um, vaccinations, the booster and all of this. <laughs> how, how are you seeing that? How, you know, how does it yeah. relate or not? Oh, the complexity of our modern yeah. lives, right? Um, you know, it makes me think of something a couple teachers told us, which is that um, some of the best Chinese doctors came out of a period called the Song Dynasty, which was very similar to now, which is that there was a whole lot of abundance. And so people were less in touch with how to take care of themselves and how to eat. They weren't living as close to the land. And so diseases were much more complicated. And so doctors had to be really good to figure out those patterns. And they told us this because they said, guess what? That's how it's going now for you. So we would often ask questions like this person is on five different drugs and there's this and there, how do we, and they, you know, would always say, just treat what's there, feel the pulse, look at the tongue, same as we always do, diagnose appropriately. Um, and the reason I bring that up in context to what you're saying is that I think the choices we have and the way that we think about things right now is infinitely complicated and it's really hard to know what's true. That's how I felt about the whole thing. Um, and I've seen things from a lot of different perspectives and what I keep coming back to is how much I don't know. And then what that brings me back to is this Buddhist concept of um, this now, how do I wanna relate to it? You know, and um, I think we all have to make our decisions from that place. You know, what is the truest thing for me and how do I wanna choose accordingly? Um, and that sounds easy and it's really hard. And, you know, from a Chinese medicine point of view, epidemic disease has been around for a long time and this is no different. Um, and so it's not a problem and it's not an abnormality. And that's an extremely controversial thing to say, I'm aware of that. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not a problem, therefore we don't do anything. It's just that um, we are humans on a sick planet and we get sick. Um, and this is actually an incredibly mundane and perfectly human experience that we're having. Um, and so, yeah, how do we wanna to relate to that with what medicines we, give ourselves and others, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure beyond what I just said. <laughs> yeah. And I think what Brooke is saying is so infinitely important because there is um, messaging out there that makes it seem like this isn't infinitely complex and there actually yeah. isn't a choice. That's right. Right. The That's messaging right. is you don't have a choice. This is the path and you must follow it. That's um, right. And that's incredibly disorienting and disempowering. Um, and I think that sort of righteousness is very young. Yeah. And so maybe the way to think about it is how would we bring um, some some yin into the situation, you know? That's that's a very long-standing patriarchal kind of way to think about things, right? There's one truth and I know what it is and you just get on board with it. Um, and the more yin aspect would be like, well, how do I wanna relate to this? What makes sense for me and my life and my body um, and my community and how I wanna take care of other people? Yeah, that's, I right. think that's helpful. It's a very complex issue. It's really, it's really hard. I've had so many conversations with practitioner friends in California and in New England. And um, I most appreciate the conversations I can have where we can say, well, there's this, but then what about this? And then there's this, and what about that? Um, I appreciate that a lot more than um, the righteousness on one side or another. Um, I did, well, I wanted to show you another show and tell here since we have a minute. This beautiful thing, I wish you could touch it right now. 
This is part of the Chinese herbal pharmacopoeia. It's called Dujong. It's eucomia bark. And it's a, um, it's a very kidney nourishing water seasoned herb. It looks like a snake skin. It feels like a snake skin, but it's the bark of a tree. And the beauty of it is see how it sort of has this sinewy kind of thing going on. Um, it treats musculoskeletal issues. And so you can put it in your bone broth. Um, and especially when people have injuries, I give it to them. The idea is dujong and a pig spine will cure any injury. Um, and so I just wanted to show you because I think it's so beautiful and interesting. And I brought it to my class and they were all like, oh my gosh, that's so weird. <laughs> um, but dujong is something that, um, is pretty easy to find in any Chinese pharmacy and so therefore can be ordered online. You do have to go through a practitioner, but it's a great one to put in your broths in the winter. Put it in while it's cooking. So what's that? Put it in while it's cooking. Yeah, you would put it in with your bones and your vegetables and there's lots of um, cooking herbs that we have in our, ph our pharmacopoeia that you're very familiar with already, like um, ginger. We put that in broth a lot. Um, sometimes we put a little tangerine peel, chen pi it's called in Chinese. Um, you don't want to cook that too much because it'll get too bitter, but it's really nice for keeping the digestion moving. Um, a good tea actually that I just made tonight is um, ginger cinnamon and lemongrass. Um, my Chinese herbalist, uh, recommended that to make a big batch of that and drink it all day as a way to protect from COVID. I love how simple these recipes are, but so powerful for protecting our immune systems. That was the tea that was given in Wuhan. Um, oh, yes. During the first outbreak in um, late 2019. That's right. I think you and I talked about that a while back. Oh, we did. And I might have had one more ingredient that I'm not Lemongrass, thinking of. Ginger, cinnamon. Hmm. I know. I feel like it did have another one, but I don't know what it would be. I don't remember. But yeah, that's that's Chinese medicine for you. Yeah, Chinese medicine, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions that folks have before we close? If you think of anything else, you are welcome to email me. Lisa can give you all of my information. Um, yeah, I'm available. Yeah. I have just one more and that we're talking about bone broth and bone building mm -hmm. and bone is included in all of this water time. <laughs> so what, what else for bone building? Um, I mean, my Western mind says, you know, um, weight bearing exercise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Weight bearing exercise is so, so important for keeping our bones healthy, you know, um, and that can sometimes be as simple as yoga or as direct as lifting weights. Um, but, you know, we know this from the reason I like it as not a fad or just a, um, like a scientific study is that we know women throughout centuries have been carrying babies and carrying pictures on their heads and doing things like that. And, and those societies had a lot denser bones than we have now. Um, and so that's a way we can keep our bone density. But yeah, I mean, I just love bone broth because it's like you're drinking bone and collagen. It's, it's just as digestible as it can be. And it's just as directly deeply nourishing to all those deep structures of your body. Yeah. Um, what else for bone? I mean, there's plenty of Chinese herbs, <laughs> you know, um, but sort of that easy way of getting minerals and getting calcium by eating a bunch of lightly cooked vegetables and, you know, throwing that in your bone broth. Um, at, at, at better times in my life, I'm <laughs> having a breakfast with like um, a little bit of cooked vegetables or greens, bone broth, and a couple eggs cracked in it most of the winter. Cause it's kind of like, you know, all those different aspects of taste and nourishment when I'm in less of a hurry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Brooke. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun.
Yeah, thank you for your time and your wisdom. And um, I really encourage folks to, yeah, reach out to Brooke and benefit from all that she offers. And if you're in the Burlington area or wanting to travel there, um, Brooke may be taking new patients at some point. Um, I am, um, I, I'm, I'm booked till February, but I am taking new patients. So yeah. <laughs> and you can and I do, do telehealth consults and I right. do Chinese cosmology and, um, I'm trying to be more available in a, on a wider scale now. And I will be teaching classes to the wider public eventually when I figure out the best way to do that. Cause it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. And you're so good at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, wonderful. Lisa. Thank you very much. That You're was welcome. Lovely. You're welcome. Good night, you all. Take you good take care. care. You yeah. too. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.